Welcome back to the podcast, and finally, we are on our second half of the alleged Beaver Wars. We're back on the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, the Five Nations, whatever you want to call them. As addressed in the last episode, the term Beaver War itself is too simplistic and ignores all the different things going on in the 17th century among the Iroquois nations. Just to quickly summarize, yes, they wanted beaver pelts from tribes west of them in order to trade with Europeans for European manufactured goods, including guns and gunpowder. However, the much more pressing issue, which we talked about a lot in the last episode, are the plagues. Every five, six years, a almost black death level of pestilence came through the land and just wiped the slate clean, killing you know, more than 10%, sometimes more than 20%, sometimes more than 30% of any given village, sometimes much higher than that. It's going to vary, and it's going to come in waves, it's going to be unpredictable, and it's always devastating. So as much as manufactured goods would give you an advantage over other tribes and allow you to compete with enemy European groups, replenishing your population, rebuilding your family, rebuilding your village, your tribe, rebuilding the Confederacy, was far more important to maintaining an everyday, stable life. And so instead of using the term Beaver Wars, modern scholars tend to use the term Mourning Wars, as in mourning the dead. Just to review, in our last episode, we saw that the Iroquois Confederacy reached out to the West, because they had kin out that way. There were tons of tribes that spoke Iroquoian languages that weren't in the Iroquois Confederacy. The big one being the Huron Confederacy, which had a dozen tribes in it itself. And then you have the Wenro, and the Tobacco Nation, and the Cat People, and the Erie, and there's a whole bunch of them. So what did the Confederacy do when their numbers were wiped clean by waves of plague? They went out, and they gathered their cousins back unto themselves. They made their cousins their brothers. This sounds peaceful and pleasant, but it wasn't. These were a series of wars where you would go off and capture people, bring them back, torture, kill, and in some cases eat them. There was cannibalism all over the place and this you know this is a couple hundred years ago you go any place in the world there's going to be some level of cannibalism in history but more important now than it has ever been would be the adoption aspect of being a captive the Iroquois would go out and they would capture these people who spoke languages very similar to their own and had very similar ways of life village setups understanding of hierarchy uh, matriarchal society clan systems they would get gather these other Iroquois people to themselves and try to adopt them into the Haudenosaunee, into their tribes, into their clans. And the Iroquois excelled at this above any other Native, Native American group. So while this process continues into the 18th century, the Iroquois, as they are overall dwindling in numbers, gonna vary decade to decade between plagues, they're going to dwindle in numbers slightly, but their obsession with taking captives is actually going, going to keep their numbers pretty high compared to all the other Native American groups around them. So it's almost like a race to the bottom. Or because of all these plagues, these Native American groups are all jumping out of airplanes. And the Iroquois have managed to get the largest parachute. So they're going to hang in the air the longest. So while everyone is just losing members, it's tragic, really. These plagues are just wiping out tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands continent-wide of Native Americans. The Iroquois because of their captive practices, are managing to stay afloat with their parachute a little longer than everybody else. So putting European groups aside, after a couple decades of aggressively taking in captives, the Iroquois Confederacy is a monster compared to everyone else around them. They are huge. They are powerful. They are organized. So that brings us to the ending of our last episode with the destruction of Huronia. So the Huron Confederacy was another huge Iroquois Confederacy nestled into the Great Lakes. They controlled the fur trade coming from the center of the continent out to New France. This Confederacy was called the Granary of the Algonquins. Although they were an Iroquois people, they were very diplomatic and they got along with people who were drastically different than themselves. And while the Algonquin people are more hunter-gatherer types and the Iroquois tended to be more consumed with farming, Although there was a considerable amount of hunting and some gathering, of course. And even before the Europeans, the Huron were part of this copper trade network going to the far west of the Great Lakes. And so they, they really became the nexus for a lot of what was going on in North America. 
because they provided a lot of food to a lot of the groups north of them, and they were the middlemen for this trade in copper, which again, the Native Americans before Europeans came along, north of what is now Mexico, were just starting to get a, a feel for metal. They were entering what some people in the old world would have called the Copper Age. So with the Huron gone, everything is thrown up into the air. And New France is on its death throes, as a huge chunk of their income at this time was from the beaver trade, and they're basically... That's all been ruined by the Iroquois. And now the entire West is open to the Iroquois Confederacy. Whereas 40, 50 years ago, they were struggling to get by, surrounded by enemies. Suddenly, they still have a lot of enemies, but the West is open. And this is in the 1650s, 1660s. The Dutch are still around, and they're still trading them guns. So to their east, they got their buddies. To the west, they have a bunch of people who don't have guns. A bunch of people who have been scattered by wars already. To the north, they have the French who are on their knees. And to the south, they have some enemies. And we'll talk about that as they enter the story. Well, let's talk about something a little more subtle. So if you're taking in all these captives and you're adopting them into your culture, even if they're from slightly related cultures, they're going to bring in things that aren't native to your culture. And let's say 1% of your population were captives being adopted in. Well, then you could control the cultural diffusion of ideas and different things. However, with the Iroquois, it's much higher. And the further we go on this episode, the higher that percentage will be. So let's say in 1650, the percentage of the population that was captive is 5% or 10%. Not a bad estimation. It's going to go up from there. Now, how much of their old culture could you stamp out now that they're 10% of your population? And so something that the Iroquois did not intend on inheriting was a controversy inside of the Huron Confederacy that found its way into the Iroquois Confederacy. You see, the people in New France... They had been sending over Jesuit missionaries into Huronia, and they had spent a great deal of time converting Christians and then giving those Christians special privileges, including access to a very few number of firearms, which at the end of the day did not manage to save their nation, but it was there nonetheless. But now the Iroquois Confederacy has taken in both the traditionalist Huron, adhering to the old Iroquois ways, and the new Huron, who were actually Catholic. As you'll learn in next season of this show, because you will be listening next season, right? Please. The uh, Huron Confederacy was torn apart by Catholicism at one point. And then, of course, it was dismantled by the Iroquois. But now the Iroquois inherited this. Now they have these two groups. These two groups that at one point got along and now have found that their differences are so great that it will be difficult for them to live in close proximity to one another. Furthermore, this is going to draw the Iroquois Confederacy a little bit closer to the French. The French are their mortal enemies. They have been since the time of Samuel de Champlain, who used firearms on them for the first time and scared the hell out of the Iroquois. The Iroquois quickly adapted and pushed off Champlain and his Algonquin allies, Huron allies. But nevertheless, they hate the French. They've always hated the French. But now you have this element, the significant size and growing size of your population that is either consisting of captives who have converted to Catholicism or your own people converting to Catholicism from the influence of the captives. And monotheism is, is sneaky. It has a, a significant strength over polytheism. In a polytheistic or even animist view of the world. Everything has a spirit. Everything is something you could talk to, interact with, pray to. So there are a lot of beings and spirits in the world. A monotheistic religion can invade a polytheistic religion. It happens all the time throughout history. So let's say you have a faith. Let's say you're an Iroquois and you believe there are certain spirits in certain sacred places, but there are also spirits that control the hunt and the sky and the trees. Everything is alive. Everything is in this animus world where you can feel the world breathing around you and you're a part of it, right? Well, let's say somebody comes along and says to you, hey, I want to tell you about this guy, Jesus Christ. Well, that's just one more spirit to add into your view of the world. It's very easy for a monotheistic religion to insert itself into something that's polytheistic or animist. That's just one more spirit. What the Jesuits did in Heronia and what's going to happen in the Iroquois world is, yeah, we'll just sneak Jesus in there. We'll just sneak Catholicism in there 
and then slowly we'll push out everything else. So it's easy to get in. And once it gets in, it starts to push itself around. And so hold on to that thought, because we'll come back to it a lot. It's going to be a growing concern. So the Iroquois Confederacy, due to its successes, is going to start to feel the pressures of success, and they're going to start to infight. And there are going to be competitions between clans, between villages, between tribes. Not everyone's going to agree on everything all the time. And now that they have a little bit more power, uh, the consequences are going to be greater. And so we see that there are pro-French factions in the different Iroquois tribes, all of them to some degree. And even certain clans are being drawn towards French ambitions and the French religion, Catholicism. And as these competing interests grow, we see that clans start to compete themselves for captives. Imagine you're in a village and the Turtle Clan has a certain sway of power over affairs in the village. Well, geez, you know, if the Wolf Clan can take on more captives, adopt them and make them full members of the village, well, the power shifts a little bit. The consensus, which is how the Iroquois system often worked on a consensus basis, the consensus could be moved in your direction. So now we see tribes, clans, villages competing for captives. It almost becomes a race. We're all in this together. But of course, you want your side of things to have a little more weight to it. The only parallel to the American system would be, geez, if you live in a state and you like the politics of your state, you would want your state to have more electoral votes when it came to electing presidents. So we're all Americans, but if push comes to shove, you would like for your ideological side to have as much power as it could get. So especially these Huron captives who already understood Iroquois confederacies. They already understood how to make longhouses, how, how the matriarchal clan system works within a village. They, they understood almost everything the Iroquois confederacy had, the Huron confederacy had. They were perfect for assimilation, much like Americans and Canadians. We're very much alike. I know you might hate to hear that, but we're pretty darn similar. The renowned historian Jose Antonio Brandau says that the Iroquois captured two to three times as many Huron as they killed. Clearly, this wasn't about beaver furs. This was about acquiring family members, acquiring clan members. From Brandau's own calculations, he found that there's a record of 1,250 Huron being captured and brought back to the Iroquois Confederacy. Some tribe in the Confederacy, anyway. He found that the Huron were attacked 73 times from the year 1600 until its complete destruction by the Iroquois. And he says that his numbers for the number of captives is extremely low. He brings up one or two times where there are uh, Jesuits who reported entire villages full of Huron captives or adoptees. And those numbers alone would be two or three times greater than 1,250. These figures are from his wonderful book, Your Fire Shall Burn No More. So summing it up, there's this growing Christian influence, which we'll keep coming back to. There's a pro-French faction growing up inside of the Iroquois Confederacy. Now let's move very briefly over to the French side. The French overall did not want the Iroquois part of their coalition of Native American tribes. As it was before the destruction of Huronia, the French were the glue between these tribes, and they could control them to some degree. Increasingly, in the beginning, of course, the Native Americans were pushing the French around, having them do their bidding. But increasingly, the French were able to be the, the, first, among e among, the first among equals, is what I'm trying to say. Now, if we were to include the Iroquois Confederacy into this little network that the French were building, historians point out that the French would have to deal with a far larger group than themselves at this time. They would no longer be in control of this little network. They would no longer be the first among equals. The Iroquois Confederacy would dominate. And so the French, from this point on, for the next 50 years, have no intention of having peaceful relations with the whole of the Iroquois Confederacy. But as consequence for not trying to be more inclusive, the French were absolutely devastated by Iroquois attacks. Their entire economic system of getting furs from the middle of the continent out to the Atlantic and of course back to Europe was ruined. The historian Francis Jennings says, the whole region around the shores of Lake Erie was emptied of human habitation by death, flight, and capture. 
By 1650, the Iroquois Confederacy had turned everywhere west and north of it into a no-man's land. And even the allies of the Iroquois were starting to get scared. So the people of Rensselaerwick, it's recorded in 1650, they expressed a fear of being wiped out by the Mohawk, who were just next door to the east of them. Now, there was no reason to have that fear, really, but it was there. The power of the Iroquois Confederacy was being felt by everyone in every direction. Now, this is really amazing. Go back 20, 30 years. The Iroquois, some, in some points, they were on their last leg. They, they weren't doing very well. This is an incredible success story. Suddenly, they're the hotshots on the block. At this point, they have nearly taken out a European power and their own European allies are afraid of them. How many Native American groups can claim that amount of prestige or that amount of terror? A handful, there's, there's a couple, but the Iroquois are right there in the top 10% on that list. Coming up on 1651, another group close by near Heronia called the Neutrals, another Iroquois speaking group. They were called the Neutrals because they didn't take sides in the wars between the Huron and the Iroquois, well, the Iroquois Confederacy. 1651, Mohawk and the Senecas, they wipe out the Neutrals. Of course, they take as many as they can as captives. And then a whole bunch of Neutrals flee, and they scatter, and their tribal identity disappears. Scholars are still trying to find where these refugees ended up. Some ended up as far away as the Carolinas, joining Native American groups down there. And this large distance is typical. Once the Iroquois defeat your nation, if you're not absorbed into them, you get as far away from them as you possibly can. You go as far west or south or any direction that you can go and still be able to communicate or get along with other natives uh, before you feel safe again. 1651, the very same year, the Dutch convinced the Mohawk to attack the Susquehannock or the Susquehanna. There's a bunch of different names for this group of people. They're another Iroquois group to the south, traditional enemies of the Iroquois Confederacy but very similar in culture once again. And very similar in some other ways too, because here we go, 1651, the Susquehannock are huge allies with New Sweden. That's why the Dutch want the Mohawk to attack them. And in fact, the people of New Sweden have been trading them guns. So now we have an Iroquois people with guns versus another Iroquois people with guns. Not as successful as their attacks out west where the French were being stingy with handing out the guns. The Susquehannock, they were a tough bunch of people, and they were able to stand up to the Mohawk. The Mohawk would send, go down there in raids, raids after raid after raid, and the Susquehannock would push them off, would cause huge casualties. There, there wasn't a lot of success there. We're talking about the 1650s, 1651 into 1652. A bloody war, and no decisive winner. So the Mohawk have met their match here with this other Iroquois group. Nevertheless, with the Mohawk in this confederacy, they have their backs protected. And on the other side of it, the Seneca kept pushing west. They just kept going. And this caused disturbances for a thousand miles west of here. Because the Seneca might raid a hundred miles away and take out a tribe and assimilate their members. But those refugees fleeing west, either by peace or by war, are going to disrupt the tribes further that way. And so the Dutch giving the Iroquois guns way over in Fort Orange, Albany, New York today, was causing socio-political changes that you can't imagine a thousand, fifteen hundred miles inland into places that the Dutch never heard of. Sometimes the Iroquois would chase these refugee groups as they would settle down temporarily for a little while, a season or two. The Iroquois would catch up with them. And one of the weird things that the Jesuits actually record is that sometimes the offspring of the people who are running away from the Iroquois were part of the Iroquois attacking them by the time they catch up to them. So the Iroquois scatter the Pitu Nation, another Iroquois speaking people. And three, four years later, five years later, the Iroquois are hunting them down in what would now be Wisconsin, that far west. And part of the Iroquois raiding party would be the adopted members that were once part of that fleeing nation. It kind of reminds me of that movie Us, where you're being hunted by your own family. Richard White writes of this period, Never again in North America would people fight each other on this scale or with this ferocity. Amid the slaughter, people fled west. 
but by 1653, the atom bomb that was the Iroquois, they started to feel the pressure. The Susquehannock from the south, of course. A little bit of resistance from New France, who were, again, beaten down quite a bit. But even smaller Iroquois groups out to the west, like the Erie. Now, in 1653, the western portions of the Iroquois Confederacy were attacking the Erie people. And the Erie people were pushing back. They, they didn't crumble in 1653. And in fact, the Seneca especially incurred a lot of loss of life from their attacks. And so at this point, the Iroquois war machine grinded to a halt because they finally hit significant resistance. And so in 1653, the four Western Iroquois nations, the Seneca, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, and the Oneida, agreed to meet together and come to a peace with the French. Unbeknownst to them, the French were ready to pack it in. There were actually plans in 1653 to evacuate the colony. This would have been the end of New France altogether. And the Iroquois threw them a lifeline at this point. And so the four Western nations came to a peace agreement with the French. And this is the beginning of Iroquois nations actually inviting the French to live among them inviting Jesuits in, missionaries. The records are all European, so it's, it's hard to uh, exactly decipher what the intentions were of the Iroquois, but there are some indications that the Iroquois wanted to uh, begin the process of marrying the two people together, having a familiarity, marrying into one another, just as they would do with any other Native American tribe, become kin uh, to, uh, to take the league and extend it out to the French to give them a link in the chain. Now, if you notice, the Mohawk were not included in this peace negotiation. They weren't a part of the deal. Now, remember, this is the Iroquois Confederacy, but each nation is an independent, it's a nation, it's an actual nation. And so, as any nation is, they're able to enter and exit treaties at will. Being part of a confederacy does not take away the power of an individual political entity to conduct its own business. So the Mohawk stood without now, if you were to ask the French at the time, they would say, oh, the Mohawk want to, they want to push us off the continent, they want to eat us, they want to get rid of us. In reality, the Mohawk didn't want to get rid of the French. They just wanted to control the trade to New France so that they could have all the furs go through them, one thing, and then secondly, be able to play the Dutch off the French for better deals. That's all they really wanted. And that might be the only reason France, uh, New France wasn't wiped off the face of the earth is because the Iroquois never actually wanted to destroy New France. They just wanted to be the next link in that chain of trade. They wanted to control the access to New France. Nevertheless, like I said, within the Iroquois Confederacy, the other elder tribes or older brothers, the Seneca and the Onondaga, they were starting to become upset with the Mohawk. The Mohawk, although they were the guardians of the Eastern Door, were taking on more and more of these outside of the Confederacy responsibilities. And the Seneca and the Onondaga were being pushed under, so to speak, or not consulted, maybe, when they should have been. And also, remember, the Mohawk are controlling trade to Fort Orange. So we're all in this nice, happy Confederacy together. And yet when I want to trade my furs through the Mohawk Nation, all of a sudden, I'm an outsider and I owe you something. So at this 1653 peace agreement, the Onondaga tell the French about 600 Mohawk warriors headed towards Three Rivers. Trois Rivières, I believe how you say it in French. Ready to attack the settlement, obviously. And so they had warning about this. And they were, they were given away by their own Iroquois brothers. So we're starting to see the ripples. We're starting to see the breaks in the Confederacy here. This allowed the French to intercept them and capture their chief and then force a peace with the Mohawk. And this occurred around September of 1653. So at this moment, we're at peace with the French. The Iroquois Confederacy can pull into itself, recover, gain your numbers back, and then start expanding outward again. But again, there's breaks. There's breaks within the Confederacy. And we see around the same time, the Mohawks, before making that peace, they intercept some French ambassadors who are with some Onondagans. And these Mohawks actually kill some of the Onondagans, or Onondaga. And now we have, within the Iroquois Confederacy, one tribe 
killing the other tribe. This, like we've talked about in previous episodes, could cause a blood feud, spiral out of control, and destroy the entire confederacy. Of course, the issue was resolved and gifts were given and condolences were given, but it's starting to show you where things are starting to wear around the edges. Moving into 1654, the four western tribes, against the wishes of the Mohawk, asked the French to open a trading post up in Onondaga, at the very heart of the Confederacy, thereby bypassing the Mohawk and their access to Fort Orange. Now, we get to a character we've heard about in a previous episode, I believe the episode we did on the Esopus and Schenectady, the Flemish Bastard, as <laughs> records call him today. The Flemish Bastard was a Mohawk whose father was European. However, the Flemish bastard in this matriarchal society wasn't a bastard. He was a, a full-fledged member and a leading member of the Mohawk. Uh, there's a very famous speech he made when he went to the French in 1654 on behalf of the Mohawks. He found it offensive that the French would go all the way to Onondaga to open a trading post. That's the center of the Confederacy. That's where they have their sacred council meetings. That's not a place for foreigners. And again, if all these tribes make a metaphorical longhouse, you should enter through the door. That's exactly what he said. He said, ought not one to enter a house by the door? And he went on to say that what the French were doing was coming in through the chimney, and only a thief comes in through the chimney. So between these trading posts and then these missionaries being allowed into the different tribes after 1653, there was an invasion. The French were invading on a cultural level, on an economic level, much as they did in Heronia. They didn't have to come in with troops. Their actual most successful uh, ventures against the Iroquois were spiritual. And while the Mohawk were feeling the pressure of this peace with the French, which gave them every disadvantage, the Seneca and the other Western nations, they were able to push west once more. And in 1654, the Erie Nation is wiped from the earth, gone. Yet another tribe. We've talked about dozens of tribes so far. The Iroquois, get rid of the Erie. Absorbed or scattered. Peace with New France meant that the Iroquois could look outward once more. Coming up on the year 1655, a fantastic year for the Iroquois and their allies. We see that we're entering the first Anglo-Dutch War, which you can hear about in the New Netherland episodes. One of the biggest fears the English had about invading New Netherland was the counterattack from their allies, the Iroquois. One of, the, one of the reasons, you have Peter Stuyvesant, and then another reason why New Netherland lived so long against the English was because of the Iroquois Confederacy. They were feared not only by other natives, but by Europeans. Again, New France was almost wiped out of, wiped, wiped completely out of existence, and they never intended to do so. So the English were horrified by the Iroquois, both by the Dutch propaganda put out about them, and from all of these Algonquin people fleeing east from attacks by the Iroquois. It was the best publicity the Iroquois could ever have to keep the English at bay, and they stayed away. To the west, the Iroquois continued to raid places as far away as modern-day Illinois and Wisconsin. To the south, the Dutch in 1655 take out New Sweden. Thus, the Susquehannock no longer have access to firearms anymore. The Mohawk are able to press them and force them into a peace. And here's another division, though, because now the Susquehannock can concentrate on the other Iroquois tribes, because they haven't made a peace with them. Again, the Confederacy is composed of independent nations who can make their own arrangements. But now, much how the Iroquois were able to occupy much of New France outside of the settled Palisade walls, the Susquehannock were in the Iroquois Confederacy, out in the country, intercepting people. 1654, they intercepted Senecas headed towards Fort Orange. That's the center of the Confederacy, the center of the Longhouse, from the Seneca to the Mohawk. The Susquehannock were out there. But again, weakened by the loss of New Sweden, and the Dutch saw new value in the Iroquois Confederacy. Because of in 1655, of course, after they take off New Sweden, there's the Peachtree War. All the fallout of these Native American tribes that were allied with New Sweden attacking uh, what would be Manhattan Island and the surrounding areas. And so after the Peachtree War, the Dutch go to the Iroquois and say, hey, we're still in this together, right? And there's a renewal of their alliance, of their covenant with one another. At this point, the Huron, who were captured early in the campaign against the Huron Confederacy, have been in the Iroquois Confederacy five, six, seven, eight years now. And even the last few, four or five years, 
And now, in 1655, the French record that one of the Onondagan chiefs is actually a former Huron. This is an indication that the Huron are assimilating quite well inside of the Iroquois Confederacy, and they're actually retaining quite a bit of their own culture. Archaeologists working on sites from this time have noticed that the Huron pottery styles show up in Iroquois villages around this time, and they don't disappear, which means that the Huron were retaining chunks of their cultural ways that the Iroquois Confederacy didn't have before this point in time. Which is why at the beginning of our Iroquois series, when I was like, okay, this is this is what the Iroquois believed before European contact, this is the things they played, I was kind of lying there. Because we can't quite tell what was originally a tradition of one of the five nations, or their very close by next door neighbors, their cousins. It gets murky. And so it's possible that some of the things I told you about were originally activities undertaken by their... Uh, close kin nearby. The Huron, the Erie, the Tobacco Nation, the Pitoon, one of them. We can't know, but I took a best guess. Either way, by 1656, the Jesuits record that they found entire villages that were more adoptees than original Iroquois. More Huron, more Susquehanna, more anything. Even Mohegan captives, everybody. They found entire villages almost that were almost completely non-Iroquois in origin course now they would be in the process of being adopted again the plagues are coming in and they're just making this larger parachute they're just kind of hanging there in the air replacing themselves with others this is the process but now let's turn back to the mohawk who renewed their relations with the dutch being at peace with the Susquehannock. they were looking for other opportunities and they were looking to avenge old issues so now there's trading going on in New France. The Mohawk war parties were intercepting even other Haudenosaunee uh, tribesmen going to New France, saying, you can't trade up there. You're going to trade down in Fort Orange. You're going to trade through us. The Mohawks are also chasing down the last of the Huron holdouts that they can reach. In May of 1656, they attack the island de Orleans. The French, the small French island, which had, uh, had the last Huron holdouts, living with a couple Jesuits, facing starvation for years now, and plagues and all sorts of other terrors. Finally, the Mohawks just overrun it. It's, it's just gone. They killed at least 75, and the whole settlement just collapses after that point. And then we enter a very curious period in history inside of the Iroquois Confederacy, which has only really been attested to in the Jesuit relations. Again, these French Jesuits writing these uh, accounts of the Iroquois, for whom they may or may not have been there for these events and may or may not have understood what went on. But around 1655-66, the Mohawk intercept and kill three Seneca chiefs visiting Quebec. Now this begins uh, acts of retribution, blood feuds. It's said in the same period, the Mohawk and Oneida finally battle it out with one another. There's one war party versus another war party. You can find this in the Jesuit Relations, uh, Book 44, chat looks like uh, section 149 through 151 a quote from it both parties fought with each other until the ground was stained with blood and murder so now nation isn't at war with nation but organized war parties inside of the Iroquois Confederacy are warring with one another they're killing one another the Haudenosaunee are shedding their own blood now this might sound like a breakdown in the league but this is exactly what the league was designed to fix. And so in 1656, around July, there's a grand council at Onondaga. And instead of going to war with one another, the tribes work it out. There's condolences, there's gifts giving. Everything is made well again. And the Confederacy is brought back together. This is a testament to how well designed the, the grand council actually is. The system of peace chiefs that other sources called sachems, which is an Algonquin word originally, so really doesn't apply here. Uh, but the fact that we have interlocking clans and tribes dealing with one another, we have a consensus system, we have a fire in which you have to pass ideas across, you have younger and older brothers. It binds everything together because it's almost like a, uh, a system of checks and balances. Very different than the American system, but in its own way effective. In this way, you're not going to see one member tribe ever go to full-on war with another member tribe. It doesn't work that way. 
You might see contingents. You're going to see breakoffs. There's going to be a lot of crazy stuff going on. But this system is so well designed, one tribe will not outright go to war with another. Almost happened just now. But they fixed it. But the League was never set up to deal with the spiritual crisis of the new monotheistic religion. And the French were slowly asserting themselves. At one point in 1657, they realized, hey, the Iroquois, they want people. And the French had taken in tons of Huron and other groups that had run away from the Iroquois previously. At one point, they convinced a large group of them, 400 in fact, to join the Iroquois. They said, hey, why don't you go, why don't you go join the Iroquois? And the Iroquois would love to take them in. And in taking those refugees, they would also be taking on Jesuit missionaries. And so the religion would spread further into the Confederacy. Now the Onondagans themselves were split about this French influence, this Catholic influence. One of these parties was completely slaughtered by the Onondagans. So these poor captives thinking they found a, a new home in Onondaga, on their way there were completely wiped out. One guy survived, it's recorded. Others made it. And the Jesuits actually living in Onondaga in 1657, one recorded the following statement about the Iroquois. Those poor barbarians feel like fathers, brothers, children, and nephews towards us when we call them by those names. Whereas the pro-French faction of the Onondagans were on the level. We want you to become one with us. Be part of our longhouse. Be part of our clans. You're part of our family. The Jesuits, although having the noble intention of wanting to save souls, they were not on the level with the Onondagans in the sense that they didn't mean to become relations with the Onondagas. They wanted to change them fundamentally. Again, in an attempt to save their souls, but they weren't forward with that. They said, hey, yeah, we, we just want to be close to you. We'll help you with your fur trading and whatnot. Let me tell you about this, uh, these religious practices we have. We're a unique type of medicine man. But as we know from the Huron example, which I'll talk about next season on the show, that's the beginning of the pressure. And then very slowly, the Jesuits have a way of creating classes, uh, making the Christians who they convert uh, special with extra privileges, extra connections. And then slowly, they take control. But again, the Onondagans were divided on their opinion on the French or on Catholicism. And we see this very same year, uh, Onondagan by the name of Hatriwati which basically means Big Mouth, and we'll hear a lot about him in the future. He's imprisoned in Montreal for God knows what. I, I can't find a record of it, but just general mayhem. <laughs> him and eight others are imprisoned, and they escape. And they're going to get their revenge in a couple years. We'll wrap around back to it. The French are using this uneasy piece to also go down and talk to the Dutch a little bit. 1658, Father Le Moyne, he goes down there and he says, hey, you know, we're up here in New France. There's not very many of us. There's not very many of you. We're very far away from home. How about other than furs? How about we uh, open up trade with one another? Just allow it to happen if it happens. We have certain stuff from France. You have stuff from the Netherlands. We should be able to deal with one another. And so these two European powers have a sort of detente. There's far worse things going on in North America right now, the Dutch and the French don't need to be at each other's throats, especially when the English are just teeming in numbers, and the English uh, abroad are engaging in so many wars. Oh, but this very same year, the French are very quietly, very slowly arming the native enemies of the Iroquois Confederacy. And this isn't entirely their fault. These native groups are without guns and they might be traditional or new enemies of the Iroquois. And what they want most of all from the French are guns. It's supply and demand. And what these tribes are demanding are firearms from the French. And the French are providing. And so whether the Iroquois were aware of it or not, uh, the dark clouds on the horizon were building. They were growing, they were swelling. The Mohawk may have been the most attuned to the machinations of New France, and after the Flemish bastard gave them a warning, basically saying, stay out of Onondaga, you come in through us, come in through the Mohawk. In 1658, the Mohawk move in secret to destroy the French mission at Onondaga. Remember, the entire Onondaga nation 
was one settlement at the time called Anandaga. However, there were many Christian converts there. And by this time, they were pretty keen on the French. The French faction was strong. And the anti-Mohawk faction was very strong too. The Onondagans get word of this, and they warn the French. And the French flee, just as the Mohawk are about to appear and wipe them off the face of the earth. It is at this point that the relations between New France and the Five Nations starts to break down again. And of course, it will spiral out of control in the 1660s. And still, the four nations west of the Mohawk are having difficulties with the Susquehannock to their south. Now the Susquehannock are not only trading with some Dutch traders illegally for firearms, they're starting to get support from the English. And the Susquehannock raids on the other four of the five nations are going to become so severe, some of these tribes are actually going to start to migrate up into the northwest, where the Huron used to live and beyond, just to try to get a little distance between them and their enemies to the south. Closing out the 1650s, we see that the Mohawks step in and they act as mediators in the Dutch Espis Wars between the Dutch and the Esopus tribe, or the Espis tribe. Doesn't matter how you say it, that's how I'm gonna say it. Around the same time, the Mohawk go to the Dutch and they say, hey, we're organizing a prisoner exchange between us and another tribe to get our people back. Could you come along as a mediator and help us do this transaction? You're in this covenant chain with us. You're one of our allies. This is part of the job here. It's time for you to pull your weight. And the Dutch replied, what? What is that? I don't even know what that is. There was no one at Fort Orange who was qualified or felt ready to do that for the Mohawks. So the Mohawks went away going, you know, these, these Dutch, they really just don't get it. And right up to the end of New Netherland, the, the Dutch never really were in step with Mohawk culture or Iroquois culture in general. Sometimes they tried to learn. Later on, they started intermarrying with each other and the Dutch residents and what would eventually become New York, they start to actually learn what, <laughs> what the deal is. But at this point in time, the 1650s, most of the Dutch, and especially those working for the Dutch West India Company at Fort Orange, they have no idea about native culture. They know that the pelts come in and they want certain things for those pelts. That's the end of it. So the Mohawk go away once more disappointed with their Dutch quote unquote allies. And in fact, the very next year in 1659, they show up in the uh, Fort Fort Orange court minutes where the, the uh, Mohawk actually complain to the Dutch. They say, The Dutch indeed say we are brothers and we are joined together with chains, but that lasts only as long as we have beavers. So at this point, the Mohawk and the other Iroquois, they've realized that the Dutch aren't children, as we've talked about in previous episodes. How the Dutch, they don't know the, the, the manners, they don't know how to travel village to village, they don't understand gift-giving culture. They're like children. That's how the Iroquois saw them. Now they're realizing, no, they're not like children. They've had a chance to learn. Okay, they're just plain rude, all right? They're just not great people. And so, by, the, by, by about 1659, 1660, they realize this is a material relationship. They're starting to understand trading in the European sense rather than the Native American sense. And this reflects the general shifting of power in North America from clearly natives are in control to the Europeans are starting to be on par with the power natives can wield. The Iroquois and other native groups on the East Coast anyway by this time had also forgotten a lot of their traditional skills that they needed before they had access to European goods and just raw metal. For example, napping flint. It's, it's, a, it's a very intricate artwork. It's a craft, really. And you could do things terribly wrong. Or you can just completely mess up your own hand on the sharp edges if you don't do it right. Napping flint was starting to become a lost art. Well, it was a lost art by this time. Because metal was so plentiful. And you could reuse and reshape metal. And the Iroquois, by this time, have had basic metal working abilities casting and whatnot for the last 30, 40 years. Remember, they got it quite early on. And so you could take the most worn piece of metal that you have and you could still make a little arrowhead out of it. Kind of an end of the line activity. So napping flint started to disappear as a skill. But that also pertained to any sort of basket making, pottery. Traditional cooking was augmented by Dutch iron kettles. English really light kettles that they actually preferred because they were light and more portable. Hunting skills, of course, because now firearms are introduced. Farming uh, implements, how to make traditional farming implements replaced by European goods. The introduction of domesticated animals. Before this point, we hear that the Iroquois sometimes have a bear in an enclosure. 
Uh, they have pet dogs at times. But now they've, they've really taken to pigs. Swine. Pigs are the closest European domestic animal in terms of behavior to dogs. So they took to living in Native American cultures a lot easier than other domesticated animals. Pigs can be more or less free range, and they require the sim same or similar amount of care as would a domesticated dog. And so the Iroquois took a liking to pork. Archaeologists have found in Mohawk burial sites coming into the 1660s here that all of a sudden we see for the first time natives buried with Christian crosses. Now, if you remember, in a previous episode, the, the first half of the, our, our Beaver War section here, there was a time where if a Catholic priest even so much as made the sign of the cross to a child, and this is recorded, they'd kill that priest. It was seen as a sign of death. It was seen as something that would bring pestilence, bring disease. Now, all of a sudden, 30 years later, people are being buried with their crosses. And for the Mohawk especially, scholars attribute this to all the Huron and other native groups that were incorporated with them instead of uh, Catholic missionaries. With the captives came the missionaries. In fact, at this point, some scholars speculate that the Five Nations might be composed of more adoptees than original Haudenosaunee. In other words, the if you took a census of the Five Nations in 1660, some scholars believe what you would find is that most of the gene pool actually came from outside of the Haudenosaunee in, let's say, the year 1600. Does that make sense? Am I, am I explaining that clear enough? Last one. So most of the people in the Haudenosaunee, in the Five Nations right now, 1660, would either be former captives or descendants of former captives, rather than descendants of just the Iroquois Five Nations alone. Now that might sound controversial, right? But you have to remember that the Iroquois don't see, they don't... They don't understand family, and they don't believe in family as just this gene thing. I, you know, my kids have half my genes, therefore I care about them. That's not the Iroquois conception of family. Family is an active thing. It, it needs to be renewed. It's a, a relationship between people, not a relationship between cells and proteins. These same archaeologists have found small beads from the middle of the continent, far, far away as uh, Minnesota, really, showing that the Iroquois at this point had a very wide net of trade. And it wasn't always conducted through warfare by this point in time. In fact, the French became really scared of the Iroquois' ability to be diplomatic. They weren't always vicious warriors. Sometimes they were pretty straightforward statesmen. And the French actively tried to cause dissension within the Haudenosaunee. Because ultimately, if the five nations can agree with one another, and we can have this east-to-west trade network feeding into Fort Orange, well, that's less furs going up into New France. So they couldn't have that. More and more, New France is going to want to crush the Iroquois. And they're going to concentrate on that to a greater and greater degree. In fact, during this time, warfare between the two political entities starts to break out again. And once again, the archaeological record reflects this too. The Iroquois were becoming so good at getting those furs to Fort Orange that they stopped repurposing metal. They didn't have to reuse metal anymore. There was such an active supply coming in from the Dutch. They didn't have to, oh, they, my axe is all worn down and broken down. Okay, I'm going to chop it up and smash it and reshape them into arrowheads. You didn't have to do that anymore. There were so many furs coming in from the west, and there was so much metal coming in from the east, they could reuse it up. They could be a consumer culture. And in fact, moving into the new decade, the 1660s, the Iroquois striking out again against the French basically controlled the countryside once more. The French, again, restricted to their Palisade cities, Palisade cities, Palisaded settlements, and the Western trade for them grinding to a halt. The countryside was controlled by the Iroquois once more. People in the French records, they lamented and said, you know, we can't even leave our houses. We, we go outside these Palisade walls. It's, it's crazy. We're likely to be killed. The very same year, a Jesuit recorded his, his astonishment that the Iroquois were able to bounce back so quickly. Every five, six years, you know, opposite the plagues and the devastating wars, somehow the Iroquois just end up back at the top again. His uh, translated term would be at the top and the bottom of the wheel. And so the Iroquois were able to be 
down and out, and then so quickly find themselves all the way back up once again. It's this very same year that we get this epic battle of Long Su, which the Canadians have held up as their own version of the Alamo, this fight to the death, this I'm surrounded, there's a siege, but I'm not giving up until the very last man falls dead scenario. The hero in the French version is this man by the name of Adam Dollard. Yes, I'm using the English pronunciation. Now, Adam went out with a bunch of militiamen, and his exact intentions are not known, whether they were offensive or defensive. Of course, in the French version, they're completely defensive. However, modern scholars see that there might have been other motives, profit involved, intercepting canoes full of furs, that kind of business. I'm not going to get into the debate here. Anyway, here's the action. So Adam and his militiamen get holed up into this small fort. It's said that the palisade around it wasn't even done being constructed. And that's when the Iroquois show up in vastly superior numbers. When the Iroquois advance upon the small fort, the French open fire, and they take out the first wave right away. Of course, the Iroquois back off them, they hide in the brush, right outside of gunshot. Still, they were battling back and forth at times, and at one point, the Seneca chief fell dead, right in front of the fort. And the French fought through the lines to grab the dead Seneca chief and drag him back into the fort, where they cut off his head and they stuck it up on the palisade for the Iroquois to see. But in this group of Iroquois are a bunch of former Huron. And with Adam are a bunch of Huron, who of course ran from the Iroquois and have been taking refuge with the French. Now they're here fighting with the French. But those Iroquois Huron, they start to lure out their relatives with promises. Come over to our side. Don't be slaughtered with these Frenchmen. Come over here, you'll be adopted like us. You'll be in my clan. We can be brothers once more. And slowly but surely, the Huron on the side of the French start leaving the fort. And so the French force gets smaller and smaller. Not by musket balls, but by persuasion. And the Iroquois were very persuasive. Once these Hurons were over to the Iroquois side, they started slaughtering them. Five of them died before the remaining 35 ran off into the woods and found refuge back at French settlements that they had been to before. At that point, the French must have realized that their fates were sealed. Clearly, the Iroquois didn't want to negotiate. This wasn't supposed to be some force of strength to force a deal on a greater national level, colonial level. This was just people out for blood. Of course, cutting off their chief's head might have had something to do with this shift in attitude. Before the Hurons came over, which proved a fatal mistake, the Iroquois built large wooden shields, uh, thick enough that a musket ball couldn't make it all the way through. And so, in a sort of Greek phalanx style, actually reverting back to how Iroquois fought 50, 60 years ago, before firearms were introduced by Europeans, they bunched together, made a movable wooden wall of sorts, and pushed up against the palisade wall itself, and started to hack away at it. Dollard, in his desperation, he took an entire powder keg, and he lit it on fire, and then he meant to throw it over the palisade walls into the crowd of the Iroquois. However, it hit the top of the palisade, came crashing back down, and created a massive explosion within this tiny fort. And that alone just about wiped out any resistance the French had left, as it killed most of them. The Iroquois swarmed into the fort, and they only had four survivors left. Three of them so badly wounded they didn't even bother taking them away. They just put them along the walls of the fort, lit the fort on fire, and burned them to death. The fourth one they took back, and they tortured in their usual fashion. And that is the Battle of Long Sioux. Of course, at this point, the French used this as a rallying cry. But there wasn't a lot left there for the French to rally. They were still suffering. New France had never really recovered from the last round of wars with the Iroquois. First of all, most of their population were men. The population of the entire colony was 3,000 people or less. So naturally, their numbers aren't going to recover by biology, of all the reasons you learned about in health class as a child. Furthermore, there was very little immigration to New France from Old France which meant as beaten down as the Iroquois were, and as little time as they had to recover, they had done so far better than the French ever could have. And the Iroquois could essentially go through the country of New France and go right up to the palisade walls of these settlements and conduct all sorts of atrocities. For example, Hatrawati, 
the Onondaga, who escaped prison several years ago in Montreal, found his way back with a group of 30 Onondagans in 1661 to avenge his imprisonment. He ended up killing two men just outside of Montreal, and he beheaded a priest, tore the robe off the priest, and proceeded to march and dance around the outside of the city, wearing the robe of the priest, just to gloat, just to show off, look at what I can get away with just outside your walls. Hot Rewarty on his way back actually ran into another Onondagan, a man by the name of Garakanti. Sorry if I said his name wrong. He's an Onondaga. He's probably the guy who warned the French missionaries at Onondaga of the incoming Mohawk attack. And this guy later on will be that first generation of born in the tribe Iroquois who convert to Christianity. Now we have this tense moment where these two Onondagan leaders are facing off. One is of the pro-French faction, one obviously anti-French. Furthermore, Giron Conti is escorting a Seneca embassy to the French to renew a peace agreement with one another. Hot Rewati is talked down, but there was almost another attack and another interleague conflict right there and then. And once again, we're starting to see that the major conflicts within the League, although based around the beaver trade and access to Fort Orange, New France, the one that's really going to start to tear them apart is going to be religion. Three Rivers, or Trois Rivières, I believe that's how you say it in French, is also suffering massively from attacks from the Mohawk and the other Haudenosaunee. At this point in the history of New France, the Canadian section of it, outside of Acadia, consists of three major settlements. So it's Montreal, it's Trois Rivières, and it's uh, Quebec, the actual Quebec City, Quebec. All three were down and out at this point in time. There was absolutely no business being conducted. There was no growth to be expected. The colony was about to be abandoned. But just as all hope seemed lost for the French, in spring of 1661, the Cayuga, the Onondaga, and the Seneca, they open up peace negotiations once again. And with these three nations coming to a separate peace with New France, that only left outstanding the Oneida and the Mohawk, which, very formidable, but they, it's not all five nations all together attacking you. It's down to two. And now you might say to yourself, well, why, why when they had New France against the ropes, why would they give in? Why would some of these nations come to a separate peace? Well, we've mentioned some of these reasons before. First of all, they never really wanted to wipe out New France. They wanted to control the trade to it. They wanted access to the unique French goods that they couldn't get from the Dutch or that they could get cheaper from the French. And wouldn't you know it to the south, those pesky Sesquihenna or Sesquihenoc were still raiding and pillaging all the western portion of the uh, Haudenosaunee, the Five Nations, the Iroquois League, and the Cayuga in particular would spend the next two or three years continually migrating northwest, northwest to the other side of Lake Ontario. Now the Mohawks, still having a tenuous peace with the Sesquihenoc, they're more focused on New France and keeping their relations with New Netherland. So, the same year, 1661, we see that they, the land for what is going to become Schenectady, New York, is purchased, and the Dutch are starting to move into the Mohawk River Valley. This land was formerly occupied by the Mohegan, at least as hunting grounds, and they were pushed out by the Mohawk in the great Mohawk-Mohegan War, the Mohegan-Mohawk War in the 1620s. And the Mohawk did move into that area, and some of these Dutch people wanted to settle close to them. And so we see this interesting uh, ground here, where you have the, the uh, Mohawk who are most interested in the Dutch, living close to the Dutch who are most interested in the Mohawk. And we see a lot of marriages, to say the least. This would be the beginning of this cultural crossroads between the Europeans and the Haudenosaunee that would continue all the way up through the American Revolution. And that, that border between the two and their peaceful relations would go from Schenectady all the way out to Johnstown, Amsterdam. It would keep moving up the Mohawk River Valley as the Europeans multiplied in number. Moving into 1662, there's another outbreak of smallpox. The historian Bruce Trigger uh, accounts for at least a thousand deaths within the Iroquois League, which may have numbered as few as 20,000 at this time. So that's 5% of your population gone. But overall, the Iroquois were doing very well compared to other Native American groups, which allowed them to conduct raids in parts of what, what is now, you know, the middle of Canada, all the way down to what is now Virginia, uh, well into New England. And then as far away as Ohio, 
in the western direction. Again, with this race to the bottom with population, the Iroquois were keeping afloat compared to every other native group. And so they were able to conduct these raids hundreds and even a thousand miles away. And with that came more complex forms of warfare. You can't do a raid 400, 500 miles away and not have a plan already for provisions. How are you going to feed yourself? What happens if something goes awry? Where are you going to fall back upon? How are you going to find your way around? Who are your, who are your guides? Who's going to be your allies? Uh, warfare becomes infinitely more complex to the Iroquois from this period on. And yes, there are reports of Iroquois raiding parties taking captives, and part of their food supply for the way back home would be the captives. This is the moment where the Iroquois are tapping into tribal groups they have never had warfare with before, where their reputation for ferocity has not made it there yet. So the psychological terror of the Mohawk or the Oneida showing up at your back door isn't there yet. The reputation has not followed them. So now they're dealing with groups who are going into conflicts with them without having this detrimental pre-existing fear. Furthermore, the English more and more are selling guns to natives. So now they're encountering uh, native groups who aren't terribly scared of the Iroquois, at least not yet, and are also armed. So 1663 ends up being a year of contraction for the Iroquois. Again, there's that wheel that the uh, Jesuit missionary talked about. How sometimes they're on top of it, and then all of a sudden they're right down there on the bottom. But sure enough, they'll recover and come back again. And now the wheel is starting to tip a little, perhaps, in the downward direction. We see that the Mohawks, especially, are warring with all these tribes in what is now New England. All these Algonquin people. Especially the Mohegan, which have been lurking. Because, of course, the Mohawks had taken their homeland, and the, and the Mohegans, they want it back. And finally, in the 1660s, they surge forward into Mohawk country. And it wasn't just the Mohegan, it was these other Algonquin tribes. They were being armed by the English, and even the Dutch were selling some of these groups guns. Again, individual Dutchmen with supplies of guns, they'll sell to anybody if the goods are there. The Haudenosaunee's own push into New England uh, was a failure during this year. So in fall of 1663, the Mohawk, Onondaga, and Oneida all teamed up to attack the Sukhoi in what is modern-day Connecticut, suffer huge loss. It's a failure. Uh, it, it didn't accomplish its achieved goals, and the Haudenosaunee retreated back to their homeland. But ultimately, on this eastern front of the Iroquois Confederacy, the Algonquins didn't gain land back. They didn't take any of the Hudson River Valley, for instance, or any land near Lake George, Lake Champlain. This very same year, around 800 Seneca, Onondaga, and Cayuga warriors, they finally go south in this massive number to take on the Susquehannock. They come upon this one settlement of the Susquehannock, Susquehannock, there's a bunch of names for them, and their first attack is immediately pushed off. And the Iroquois realize, these people have guns. These people have cannons. They're building European-style fortifications around their town. What's going on here? As it turns out, at some point, the Iroquois League became enemies of the colony of Maryland. And Maryland had not only been selling guns to the Susquehannock, now they were actively trying to pump up this tribe as a blockage or a destructive mechanism to the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois realized that they're outmatched. And they scream up to the Palisades, Hey, let's talk this out. Uh, can we come to some sort of deal? Uh, clearly, let's, let's try to arrange at least a, a temporary peace. Uh, how's it sound? And the Sesquihenna said, We'll think about it. Put together a delegation of men. We will let them inside our walls, and we'll discuss it. A delegation of 25 men are assembled from the three tribes participating. And they go inside of the fortified village, and the Susquehannock sees them. There's no negotiations. Nothing's going to happen here. And they drag them to the top of the palisades, and they tie them to the poles on top of their walls, and then they light them on fire and burn them alive in front of their friends, family, and fellow warriors. Then the Susquehannock emerge from the walls and from nearby villages, and they swarm the Iroquois army, and they chase them all the way back to the land of the Haudenosaunee. This is not looking like a very good year, but at least they can count on some level of peace from the beaten down French in the north, right? Come the year 1663, Louis XIV himself revokes all of the charters, all the permissions, all the monopolies belonging to these 
small new French corporations, and he personally takes control of the colony. It becomes a crown colony of the King of France, Louis XIV, the Sun King himself. Relatively young at this point in time, the French Empire under his rule will have over 20 million inhabitants. Mind you, the Iroquois Confederacy at this time had somewhere around 20,000. That's a thousand to one. And in the decades to come, he will encourage massive immigration. He will be sending over French regulars, not just militiamen, not just fur traders with guns, trained soldiers to New France. The Iroquois will never face an enemy as dangerous as the Sun King. And although in this very same year, Garakanti or Garakantai of the Onondaga confirmed a peace with at least the four Western nations of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk abstaining from this peace arrangement, France was planning on the complete destruction of the Iroquois Confederacy, starting with the Mohawk, making an example out of them. That brings us right to the faithful year, 1664. When the covenant chain is broken, as the colony of New Netherland, their source of guns and other manufactured goods, is quickly taken over by the English, suddenly the Iroquois are as they were 60, 70 years ago, inland, broken off, isolated. We know what the future looks like for them, but at that time they didn't know how relations with the English in the Hudson River Valley would turn out. Would they be able to enjoy the same sort of relationship they had with the Dutch? Or would the English be more like the French? The Iroquois don't know this yet. And in this very same year, if you turn to the north, the Iroquois didn't notice, but the French were very well aware that the boats started landing and French troops were arriving. And the first wave of French regulars made it to within 60 miles of Mohawk country, where finally they were beaten back by the cold weather as they attacked in the middle of winter and were chased back across the St. Lawrence by the Mohawk themselves. This would prove to just be the head of the spear. But why did I save this episode for the last of the season? Well, we saw New Netherland rise and fall. We saw New Sweden rise and fall in an even shorter amount of time. And all we are left with is the Haudenosaunee. The 17th century is full of surprises. And at the end of this season, we see that our Native American group is the last man standing. Now in our upcoming seasons, we need to get ourselves caught up to 1663-64 with uh, what the French are doing and what the English are doing. But we're going to circle back around to the Iroquois eventually because they're going to be a big part of this series for a very long time. Mm -hmm.